Superstorm Sandy set up a battle between locally determined recovery efforts and disaster capitalism. So far, the disaster capitalists are winning, but not entirely. We'll get an update from a businesswoman in the Rockaways, Lorena Giron, and Brenda Martin of The Working World, an organization that helps co-ops in low-income communities. Then we hear from noted Marxist geographer and anthropologist David Harvey about what happens when the world of finance rules over government. We're all about catastrophes, cooperatives, and capital this week. On the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. In the wake of Superstorm Sandy back in 2012, a grassroots relief effort growing partly out of Occupy Wall Street did its best to help the hardest hit area of the Rockaways. Networks grew up offering business assistance and loans, and gradually the worker owned Rockaway cooperatives, or WORCs were born, offering residents in this remote part of Queens, New York, a way to meet their immediate needs while kind of staving off what author Naomi Klein has described as disaster capitalism. Well, all these years on, how are those efforts faring? Is there, in fact, an alternative path for developers after disasters? And if so, what do the Rockaways have to teach? Places like Florida after Hurricane Michael or Puerto Rico after Maria. To talk about all this, we are joined by Lorena Giron. She is a Rockaways resident and co-owner of the La Mis Bakery. And Brendan Martin, no stranger to this program, founder and director of The Working World, a nonprofit that provided free business development training and ongoing technical assistance to many of the Rockaways co-ops. Welcome to the program. Glad to have you, Lorena. Wonderful to have you back, Brendan. Thank you. Um, for those who have forgotten, uh, it seems like a long time ago, um, Storm Sandy. We've seen a lot of storms since. Tell us a bit about what happened to you and in, in your community back then. And then from Brendan, just help us describe the Rockaways. What are we talking about when we're talking about the Rockaways, New York? You want to start? Sure. Um, you know, the Rockaways is, as you mentioned, it's in one of the corners of New York City in, the, in, um, in what is the metropolitan area. It's not, there are summer homes out there, there are some vacation homes, but the majority of people who live out there, it had a lot of uh, endemic poverty long before the storm happened. Um, the storm helped to uncover some of that and expose um, just how unprepared uh, the infrastructure is in the poorer parts of our city when something bad happens. Um, so it's, again, you will see some beautiful homes out there right by the water and some nice places to go visit, but there's a lot of people who have to work to serve those homes and to, to serve those uh, vacationers, and they do live in uh, some of the poorer tracks in, in, our, in our city. Yeah. Um, it's also below sea level, and so when you had, um, when you had a, a storm like Sandy hit, um, you know, it, it, just, it just walked right through that, that community, um, it, just like a house of cards. How was it for you, Lorena? Where, where were you and what happened to you? The day of the storm, we were in Far Rockaway, which is where I live. It was total destruction. There was practically no electricity. We didn't have water. There was no gas. There's no transportation. So those were very difficult days for the whole community, not only from Far Rockaway, but for all of the Rockaways. We were all in the same situation where there was no food or water. Many people left, but many also stayed in their homes. So there were a lot of problems. Mm. And at what point did people come to help? When, when did you get a sense that people were coming to help? The minister organized us so we, as individuals, could help the community because there was no transportation. And we got in contact with the group, Occupy Sandy. They were the first to arrive. They brought food, and our church was the place where they organized their relief effort. Then we began, together with them, to provide food for the community. So it started with food. Yes, the food, water, clothes as well. These were basic needs for the people, especially the food and water. But gradually, and Brendan coming to you, gradually it became not just about immediate needs and relief, but also, as I remember we talked about at the time, around 
how this community will come back together. Can you talk about your, your part of that? Sure. Um, so I work for an organization called The Working World, and we do investments and technical assistance to people who want to start their own businesses and run them as uh, cooperatives. Uh, we'll work in some of the hardest parts of the world. Um, we started in Argentina after the crisis there. We work in the countryside and, and cities of Nicaragua, and we've worked all over the United States. Um, and when Sandy happened, and the people from Occupy Sandy, as Lorena mentioned, they were the first to respond. Um, they also reached out to us because they said, we know that, as Lorena called it, this is just the first needs to get people food, water, uh, and clothing. And then what do they do next? Um, they, need to, they need to have, they need to get jobs of their own economic means or else they're probably going to be um, shipped out of here. They're going to lose their homes. I mean, there, there was a lot of lessons learned from what happened in New Orleans and how many people temporarily um, were made to leave permanently in the end. And um, the, the rebuilding was clearly going to happen. And would the people who are residents mm. be part of that rebuilding? So that's why they reached out to us to say, what if you can help build, make some businesses that will be owned by the local folks so they can afford the new rents that'll occur, et cetera? So at that time, I remember we went and did a little report on, on you going out there and the work that was happening in the mm -hmm. Far Rockaways. Let's take a quick look. I live in Arburn, which is right next to Far Rockaway. So I was in the area of the Rockaways where the bay and the sea met. It was completely overcome. I'm thinking if somebody was above while the storm was happening, you would have probably seen a whole middle section of Rockaway disappear. That was my section. For the next month, I was living basically at our church, <laughs> my husband and I and our family, and we ended up running a pantry 24-7 um, because a lot of people from um, Occupy had come in and started uh, sending supplies into the area. We would wake up and give supplies out, and we would close the church and go to sleep and wake up again the next day and do the same thing. And that was our life for about a month and a half. Far Rockaway, which is where we are, is uh, has been in poverty for a long time. And so there was a crisis here before there was a storm. So just the idea of creating jobs is an outgrowth of the storm because so many people lost their jobs. I was hearing this idea of co-ops in a lot of different circles, and I had worked with Brendan from the working world, so we had some meetings with him, and I knew he was there. I think every single person in the working world did some volunteering with Occupy Sandy uh, soon after the hurricane. So in a sense, there was an exposure to it. And then finally, in late January, at our first meeting out in the Rockaways with a bunch of people after kind of planning this idea of maybe going to a worker center, um, trying to bring together people who might be interested in this. Instead of trying to reach out to one group, we said, we start, we offer, we tell people, hey, well, you know, if you want to start a business and you want it to make it community, root in your community and owned communally as a cooperative, we're going to offer classes to do that and, and use a, like a worker center or, um, as a way to reach out. And, and then we'd be able to teach multiple groups at once. The Rockaways are going to be rebuilt. The question is really about who is going to be rebuilding them. And, and so I think that this initiative is really about saying we want it to be locally owned, locally controlled, um, and for the benefit of the people who live there, as opposed to, you know, let's tear a lot of stuff down and put in these new development condos. It takes you back. Yeah. I guess that was shot in 2013. Wow. Some of these Important. projects were on the way. Um, what stands out to you, Brendan? In, in looking back at that, yeah. um, I mean, the devastation there was clearly huge. Is that different? Is that I'm recording those videos, lo que pasó. Um, the devastation was, I mean, it, it's changed there, um, and I could talk about in what ways. Um, not all positive, but the devastation, you don't see it anymore the same way, although you do see it on the news and all the new places there are storms, something very similar. Um, going back, I'm still, I'm still blown away by the amount of energy came together voluntarily. There's two churches that came together with um, people from two different congregations who formed together to, to do classes. They showed up all night to take a class on business development. There was people from all across New York who volunteered to go out there and teach those classes. Uh, food was provided. You know, it was really well organized without any outside help. There were some donations left over from Sandy, um, and that was it. Um, what I'm struck by is how much that wasn't a seed that then would get taken over by the developers. They'd say, look at all this energy, we can build businesses, how much that was ignored actually. Um, so the, the rebuilding you've seen has occurred, but it's all outside ownership. It's mm -hmm. all people who don't live there owning condos for whose target um, purchaser or renter is people who don't live there. Mm -hmm. So I'm also struck by just how at odds 
what, what this incredible, you know, vibrant group of you know, community uh, volunteers were doing, how at odds that was with what the mainstream development um, direction wanted mm. to go. How did your bakery um, survive, uh, Lorena? Well, my bakery was established later, after Hurricane Sandy, when we realized there was a need since there were a lot of people that did not have jobs. Then the group of Occupy Sandy and some of the members of the church thought about how they could create jobs in the community. Then the idea came up of getting in contact with the working world to help us to form cooperatives. And that is how La Mies Bakery was born. We created a group of six people to start a bakery. But after a while, some people moved to other states, and so the bakery didn't continue. But with the experience that I gained from the bakery cooperative La Mies, I am now working for the working world, giving loans and trying to help the new groups that are forming, being incubated as cooperatives, but also if there are any businesses that would like to transition to cooperatives, we are also working on that. So you're still a big believer in the cooperative model. Can you talk about why? I think that it was something new for the community. In my case, I had never heard of what it meant to work in a cooperative. But I think that is very important because not only are jobs being created, but the economic resources are staying inside the community. They aren't going to another place. And something that I also like is working in our community. We are teaching people that we can. Like in the case of my community, it's a community of immigrants, and we are teaching them that we can work together in group to improve the economy of our family and also of the community. But as you just said, it's not so easy to keep the group together and to keep the business together necessarily. It's difficult. Yes, it's hard, but we are learning. And during these years, we have learned that, yes, it can be done. Yes, we can work in cooperatives. Yes, we can work as a group. And we can advance like a community as well and improve the economy for the family. All right, so si se puede, but the challenges are big. Um, you were touching on that before. Let's go into that more deeply. Okay. What have been the challenges to having this model be more successful? Yeah. Um, and is disaster capitalism out there winning? Yeah, so I mean, I'm just going to pull out a couple of pieces of, of Lorena's personal story to, to touch on that and then, yes, look at it in a bigger context. So what was interesting for them, you know, she and these six people, they did run a bakery for a number of years and use that for their living, but a lot of people as we feared, found that it was too hard to actually survive in the Rockaways, and they moved to other states. Yeah. Um, so, but with the successful experience of working in that bakery, Lorena decided, um, we said, we, you know, hey, what a, you can now help do what we're doing. And she's helped um, incubate a couple other cooperatives out there. She just recently helped convert a business um, that was, had been run for 20, 30 some years out in the Rockaways. Now the workers own it, and she's been the lead to help convert that. There's another, the construction co-op that started during that was in the same cohort that she was in is still running and she's their main uh, support now. So that's been really interesting. But it's still seeing the challenges that a small business has yeah. in an environment where rents are rising like they are. And when you watch the rents are rising because the taxpayer dollars that supported redevelopment are actually going to help developers create more expensive places to live. Because they're getting tax breaks, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, a lot, a lot of the tax breaks. Um, yeah, different, they have a lot of different supports. Um, that only large developers can end up qualifying for, it turns out. Um, and those who are actually changing the community, it looks, from a, from a standpoint of our houses built, it looks better. From a standpoint of are the residents there doing better, it, it's not so clear. Um, and plenty of people found themselves priced out. So even if they had a little business that was doing well, um, the, the oceans around them you know, swallowed them up a bit. So what we saw was th there's a way to rebuild that's about taking the current residents, developing their skills, like Lorena got her skills developed, giving a chance, giving some capital to start a business and building for what's there, or you can come in from the outside. Yeah. Um, and they're not just like ships that pass the night, two different strategies, and they don't really inform each other. There's a way you get a sense that um, some people, there, there are forces out there that want one of those strategies, the outside capital to come in, 
own the place, have the have the values rise dramatically, and, and profit from that. Even if and the current residents are often in the way. So we think, did, why did why did there why was there no support brought to this work, mm -hmm. to the businesses that were developed, to someone like Lorena whose skills? So everyone said we we need that, and we need to have more skilled people in the Rockaways. And why did they not get support? And yet all this millions and millions, um, up to upwards to billions of dollars were spent to redevelop the Rockaways. You know, some people, there are forces that aren't looking to develop the current residents. They're looking to develop just the real estate and move the residents out. Um, so the disaster capitalism, um, it's not just a mistake that people didn't take up our, our form of redevelopment. It's actually in the way. Um, mm. So it's a little bit of a pitched battle. And what about people themselves? I mean, isn't there a point probably for some people where they just say, you know what, I'll take them all. This is too hard. No, I no. want to be able to get through it. I want to be able to like get clothing. Like co-op who yeah. left. The problem, especially in Far Rockaway, not as much in other places where people have more money, but in the area of Far Rockaway, the problem is that the state has invested a lot of money, but it's designated for new houses, new buildings, but the money is not getting to where the people that have the greatest needs are. And I think if the government could invest more in the common people that have very low incomes, they have no access to buying a house, for example. But there are many other things. I think something that has impacted us from the cooperatives is that with the little money from the donations and different organizations, we have been able to advance and achieve a lot of things. Yet, if we had more help, if the community received more help from the government, I think big things could be done and more jobs could be created for the community, which is what it most needs. So a little bit of aid could have gone a long way and did go a long way. So lessons? from this experience for others? I mean, because we keep banging the drum of, you know, well, there are alternatives to disaster capitalism. I want to believe, I want to believe. Um, what are we learning? And what can we do maybe to help the people in Florida or in Puerto Rico or Houston who are still recovering from storms um, get the help that you're talking about? Well, I've learned that um, it's not just, oh, people just don't know that if, they, if only they see this example, they'll take it up. Um, you mean our fantastic video didn't do the job? That was a job? good start. <laughs> so there was a lot of support that rolled in from that. But it's a political battle yeah. um, because the, gov the government is spending money and all sorts of incentives for whom, for what, and as Lorena put it, for building new buildings yeah. that are owned by outside capital rather than for the current residents. And it's not gonna, we're not just gonna nice our way into yeah having that be dominant. I think that we have to, when, when things happen like that happen, what happened in Houston, what happened in Puerto Rico, what's happening, you know, and the storms that are hitting us right now in uh, the Carolinas, you've got to walk in right away with this. Yeah. And then absolute certainty, it's an alternative. We've seen it work with, with less than 0.1% of what was spent on the housing development, we, uh, what, what Lorena and others managed to do. But it's going to be a political battle too. I mean, I think it, it dovetails into what's happening nationally and with some of the candidates that have, that come, that have emerged um, and said enough is enough, we're actually gonna push for a different kind of economic development. I think that's the only way to get these done. You're not gonna just, we can't just be nice about it. We have to start, you know, no isn't enough. We have to start actually demanding these things from the day the storms happen. So the, the Trump presidency had its birth in government programs for construction and development. Um, Lorena for president, why not? <laughs> Lorena for presidente. <laughs> No, I'm serious. I mean, is a political is the political work that you're talking about the next step for, for you and people like you? No, I would like to work more in the community to be able to teach my people that together we can achieve a lot of things. And I think in the case of the Hispanic and African American communities, we should be more united to be able to achieve things for our community, to be able to advance. I think that is what we need, to be able to advance and have the desire to improve ourselves more every day. Beautiful. Last word from you, Brendan, as we go out to the people who are thinking about this going forward. 
Um, well, first of all, I think, you know, reluctant politicians like Arena are the best ones. So yes. I'm not taking that as a total no. no I'm taking it as a maybe still. <laughs> Puede ser. Puede ser. Porque es una manera de trabajar con tu comunidad igual. Um, you know, the, it, it, we definitely have to get past the point of think, couldn't it work? We've seen cooperatives work across the world. I just came back from Mondragon with uh, people from New York City government looking at what they're desperate for the solution that uh, cooperatives can bring. We have to get past thinking it's, well, is it maybe? Do we need more proof of concepts? And we have to go out there really like fighting for it. We, we have to demand our political rights when these, these storms that are happening, if there are people who are happy to see the storm happen because it's a way of washing away the resistance from them to develop things the way that, that only benefits that outside capital. We have to be really clear about where the stakes are. Um, that disaster capitalism wants to do what it did to the Rockaways, it wants to do what it did to New Orleans. Um, it understand what it means. It's not complicated. It's people seeing an opportunity to buy stuff cheap, move you out, and sell it expensive. Um, I, I just think we have to stick to our, stick to our principles and not take no for an answer. Lorena here on Brandon Martin. Thank you so much for being with us. It's great. Thank, thank you, you for Laura. the update. We'll keep paying attention. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching the Laura Flanders Show. More information at our website. Cooperative businesses are growing in number along with an explosion of new technologies. So does any of this add up to a change in our dominant economic system? Not necessarily, says David Harvey, noted Marxist geographer and distinguished professor of anthropology and geography at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I had a chance to ask David directly in front of a live audience at the Lenzik Theater in Santa Fe recently at an event sponsored by the Lennon Foundation. The system is always is always changing, and there are, you know the the divisions of labor and so on are shifting, and the power centers within the capitalist class are shifting. But what I object to is the idea that we're post-capitalist, which would say, "Oh, the capitalist class has disappeared." What? <laughs> you know, you say, "Let's look at the Koch brothers just to start with. Let's just take the Koch brothers and Michael Bloomberg." You know, all right? But, you know, we're past them. <laughs> we're not, and 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 I think those. I think there's a lot of techno utopian kind of thinking out there that kind of says the technology changes the world. Yeah, well, uh, technology is always important, but there's no technology that capital cannot appropriate. And look at the liberatory stuff that was there about the internet and when it first was going on and how democratic it was going to be. And look what it's evolved into with everything controlled now by about, you know, and internet neutrality about to disappear and... Talk a little bit about, about the new formations that are gathering in resistance to some yeah. of this. Uh, we've done a recent piece um, on the show about a little formerly industrial town called Preston in Lancashire, England, where um, the city council decided they'd done with begging big corporations to come and start a mall and pave over more of their streets. And instead they were gonna do a little inventory of, of how much money were they spending locally and what were they spending it on? And if they spent more locally and hired more locally, um, could they recoup some of that money and, and actually build more of an economy that people had more control over? So there, and that's just one example. They got inspired by people in Cleveland, another industrial town, formerly industrial town. Um, so a focus on place, a focus on participation, a focus on, on democracy uh, is emerging in these little pockets. Yeah. Is, it, is it adding up to something? Well, well, you start off with the fact that, 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 that a lot of people around the world are pissed off. Yeah. Okay. I call it not, um, had enoughism. Yeah, had a, yeah basta. Basta. You know. And, and, and you, you, you get a, a lot of reaction that kind. And, and some of that anger is, of course, being picked up by Trump and is being picked up by the far right and is with the source of, 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 of the neo-fascism, which is, which is uh, sort of surging around, around the world. But it's also leading to many of these other experiments with kind of saying, OK, I'm going to try and we're going to try and find, define what I would, what I'd like to sort of refer to as heterotopic spaces within the overall ghastly system, where people try to carve out a part of a piece of, of, of living where they can have decent life together and kind of co collaborate and help each other and, and, and work together. And this could just simply be an informal thing or it can become a more formal thing where people actually try to set up uh, way, you know, ways of a growing 
co crops mm -hmm. and doing things and helping each other. So there is a great deal of work at that, at, uh, energy going at, at that kind of level. Uh, the difficulty with that is at a certain point it doesn't confront the fact that somebody has to go and confront the Federal Reserve. Yeah. You know, and, and this is the difficulty of the, of the thing these days. And actually Marx talks about this when he's writing about the financial system. He says, you know, the financial system doesn't involve a conflict between labor and capital. It's really a conflict between different forms of capital. And this then kind of says to you, well, there's a real difficulty of revolution here. I mean, in the French, they could, in the French Revolution, they could go storm the Bastille. Uh, you know, in the Russian Revolution, they had the Winter Palace. And then you think to yourself, Okay, let's go storm the Federal Reserve. <laughs> and then you say to yourself, what would we do <laughs> when we got inside of the Federal Reserve? And actually there is something there which is very significant, which I call the state finance nexus, which is the real center piece of what capitalist class power is about. And, and, and actually, it has more of a feudal structure than it does a real sort of capitalistic structure. It's, it's, a, it's a bit like the Vatican of, of, of capitalism. And we sort of saw it at work in the crisis. I always remember when the crisis came and people were looking at what to do with it. George Bush didn't know what to do. Congress didn't know what to do. Who came out and told us what they were going to do? It was Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, and it was Ben Bernanke, the Federal Reserve. Those two came out with a piece of paper and said, this is what we're going to do. Uh, that, that's the state finance nexus. That does it for this episode. If you missed any part of our program, our archives are all on our website. Till the next time, stay kind, stay curious. I'm Laura Flanders.